I have to confess to you that when morning comes, the highlight of my day is not what I see in the morning mirror. Can you understand that at all? I think that might be for some of us why it takes us so long to get going and feel joyful because the reflection that we get is not like a great thing to begin with. But I found that there is scripture to help us understand what we see in our morning mirror. Did you know that there's scripture to cover this? In the beginning, it says, it was formless and void. <laughs> And darkness moved over the surface of the deep. <laughs> now the good news is that with time it says light was called in and things began to brighten up. I think for us gals that's when we get out our Clinique or our Mary Kay or our Avon or whatever and we begin to improve at least in a, a visual sense. As I looked out my curtain this morning, the first thing that I do since I've been here is open up the drapes that I might just take in the beauty of this landscape. And as I did this morning, it was a little depressing to see that some of you were already out walking. <laughs> my husband has said of me, my wife is very aerobic. She leaps out of bed every morning, runs around the block, and then kicks the block back under the bed. <laughs> of course, I've paid the penalty for not being someone who exercises regularly. I realize that. When I turned 40, my husband said to me, come on, tell me the truth. Does it bother you that you're turning 40? I said, you've got to be kidding. People have thought I was so much older for so long, it makes me feel legitimate. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, you know what I hope never happens to you? And I said, no, what? He said, I hope you never come to the place that when you wave your hand this way, your underarm waves that way. <laughs> I said, that thought had never crossed my mind. <laughs> but I learned that my husband has the gift of prophecy. <laughs> I don't think it was two weeks later when I was taking my morning shower and every bit of tone rinsed out of my body and down the drain. <laughs> now you can tell when that happens because things start moving. And, and when you move fast, it moves fast. <laughs> now you have to watch, because if you really get into motion and then you stop fast, you just... <laughs> I see some of you understand this. I wish that I was one who had exercised more that I might be firmer and that is true also in my faith. That we don't want to have a lot of unnecessary loose baggage but we want to be foundational women of faith. That we can go forth and proclaim our God and give hope to others that they too even as cracked pots can be filled with his spirit and can be directed by our holy God and through his word. When I was an agrophobic, and many of you have asked me about that, tell us what it was like for you. I found that I was unable to deal with even the littlest of things and I was into mountain making, not with my faith, but taking little bitty problems and making them major issues for myself and everyone else around. I collected fears and my fears gave birth to other fears. You see, we will reproduce whatever it is that we embrace and draw close to us. 
and I reproduced one fear after another because every time I gave in to one, it would say to its friends, over here, she's open, and they would join. And I had fear after fear after fear. And people anticipate that I will tell them, and then I found the Lord Jesus Christ and he set me free. But I must tell you that I had accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and then I became an agoraphobic. Wasn't supposed to happen that way, was it? I checked the book. The book doesn't say anything about that. It says that he has come to give life. And yet I was walking a life of death and I didn't understand. I decided it must be that God had favorites and I was not one of them. I had a very limited perspective of the Father heart of God. I did not understand the completed work of Christ. I had a lot of background issues that had never been touched or dealt with. And they were manifesting themselves in unreasonable fear. And under all of that fear was rage. And that needed to be dealt with. And because I had not touched those things, there were not the changes that I longed for. And I kept asking God to fix me in the night while I was resting, that I might rise up righteous in the morning. See, I like that idea. No pain, no pain, no gain. And that's what I found. I have a microwave mindset. See, I want to be zapped once and get on with life. Do you remember when we first got the microwaves, how excited we were that you could take a baked potato, it now did, no longer took an hour, an hour and a half, you could pop it in there, and within three to five minutes, you had a baked potato. That, that was wonderful until we got used to it. And now I put it in there, I go, come on, come on, why can't they get this thing going? See, and that is how we want our spirituality. Lord, go ahead, give it to me all now. I mean, if you are God, then surely you could do this for me. And wouldn't it be honoring to you if I could be an overcomer rather than overcome? See, our thought process is very often on this, miss the written word of God where he shows us the history of his people and the faithfulness of his hand upon them, but also that they are in process, that it is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And we want him to use some magic wand, zap us, and it be over with, and us not have to struggle or learn through the pain and that he might always keep us comfortable. You see, he does not comfort us just to make us comfortable, but so that we might extend that comfort to others. It becomes part of our ministry. And the way that he carves out inner space for his presence is often with difficulties and pain. Otherwise, we don't take the time to ask him to do that kind of in-depth work within us. I know that when I was locked in my home, I often cried out, Lord, I just want to be normal like other people. And then I got out here and found out, ain't none of you normal. <laughs> oh, you're unique and you're special, but what is normal? Normal is a setting on your dryer. <laughs> That's what normal is. And on my new book that is coming out in June is exactly that title. Normal is just a setting on your dryer. Because I've looked around and I haven't found any normal people. I sure have found a lot of people that I regard with high esteem for their responsiveness to the voice of God. And so in my process, in my journey, I found that I had to look at the past so I could go forward. And there are those of you who say, but the word of God says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press on. And that is true. But our God, when he says forgetting, is not talking about denying. Denying is full of darkness. Our God is full of light. That would not be his way. 
He longs for us to resolve that conflict and move on. He does not want us stuck in our yesterdays, just as he does not want us unwilling to consider our past. Sort of like driving your vehicle. If you do not occasionally check your rearview mirror, you can be in a whole lot of trouble. But if all you do is stare in your rearview mirror, you're still going to be in a whole lot of trouble. So there again, we are speaking of balance. I want to give you some steps that have helped me in the healing process. We have talked about the area of hiding and of hurting, and some of you have said to me, but I want to know about the healing. I know I hide, I know I have addictive behaviors, I know I hurt, but what do I do with this pain? Well, there are some important things. What I am going to give you is only a few thoughts and ideas for you to search the scriptures over and consider for your own life. This is not a completed uh, program of healing, it is just a few insights in regard to it. One of the things that we need to do is we need to learn how to break a lie. And I want to give you a visual of why that is important. I'm going to draw on this board a picture of a house. Now, this is a very simplistic house and probably one you would not want to live in. But this is as good as I can do of a house. Now, this house is very unique in that it only has one window. So whoever lives in that house has to come to the one window if they want to look out. Now I'm going to draw a stick figure me. And you can tell it's me by the bush on top of her head. I want you to think of this being yourself coming to that one window that you have as a child to look out on the rest of the world. When I come to that window to look out, from there I can see other people, and as a child, I try to make determinations about who they are and who I am and how we're going to relate. And when I want to know, is there a God, I come to my window and I look up and I try to understand about God. But one day, somebody comes into my life, a great big person, and this person can represent for us one of our parents, an older sibling, a teacher, a babysitter, a neighbor, any number of people. And this person or persons throws rocks at the window. Now these rocks come in the form of physical abuse and or emotional abuse and or sexual abuse and or deprivation. And what deprivation means is there was something you needed to feel good about who you were and it was withheld from you for some reason. It may not have been anything anyone purposed to withhold. They may not have had it to give. I remember talking with a woman who shared with me that when she was a little girl growing up on a farm that for several years the crops failed. And for them to not lose everything they had, their mother went to work. But because they lived in the country, she had to move to the city for her job. She worked all week in the city and came home on the weekends. And daddy watched over the farm and the children. This was not something this mother wanted to do. This was something she felt she had to do. It was a sacrificial act of love. And even though she did it out of love and provision for her family, it still deprived the children of something they felt that they needed, and that was the daily input of their mommy. So you see, it isn't always that someone has said, I am not going to give her that. It is that they are unable always to give you that which you need. And so you are deprived of something. Now, when one of these rocks, or a combination of these rocks, or all four of these rocks hit the window, the window is impacted. And voila, we have a cracked pot. 
Now, as I come back to the window to look, I know something has happened, but I'm so young, I am so immature, I am so insecure, I don't understand what's occurred. I know it's different, but because it's the only window I have to go to, and I return there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, I begin to believe this must be the way things really are. And now when I look out at other people, I do not see them as they are, but I see them through the damage that occurred in my life. And when I look up to have relationship with God, I do not see him as he is, but I see him through the distortion of what occurred to me. And then when I go to that window to see if I have any worth or value, the reflection that comes back to me is one of a broken image. And I believe at a very deep level that I have no worth or value. When that window was damaged, there was something else that was damaged and broken, and that was my trust factor. You see, a young child will look to the big people in their life for direction, for correction, and for protection. The very things that the big person is supposed to be looking to God for. And when the big person is not looking to God for those things, they are unable to give them to the child. And so rather giving the child what they need, they victimize the child. And the child learns a lesson. It is not safe to trust because when I trust, it causes me pain. And so they get into a control issue. And the only time that we feel safe is when we are in control. And when we are not in control, it throws us back into all of this pain. And this does not feel safe, and we certainly don't feel secure there. Now we grow up, we are introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ, we invite him into our life, and we learn that what he asks of us is that we might relinquish control and that we might trust. The two things that we don't feel safe doing. And so now even though we long to know him, we are in inner conflict with our ability to receive what he has for us because it doesn't feel safe. Now does that visual, does that visual speak to you? Can you hear the message in it? It's important that we understand about the damage and distortion because those are the very things that Christ has come to set us free from. For he knows that when we are in this broken position, there are areas and arenas of our life that we are now open to the lie of the enemy. And that's why it is important that we learn how to identify a lie. I had a woman come to me and she was sharing with me a story about when she was a little girl growing up. She said she lived next door to her grandma and her grandma, she loved to bake. And those youngins, they loved it when grandma would be over there whipping up some yummy in the kitchen. Now the kids, when they knew this was happening, would all go to Grammy's house to get some real treasures. And when they got there, the one thing that each child longed to have, even more than the cookies and the cake, was the spoon. The spoon was the greatest treasure because there was only one of those. And so they would all line up with anticipation to see who would be presented the prize spoon. Well, Grandma had a number of grandchildren, and so she thought, I want to do this in an equitable way. And so she said to herself, I know what I'll do. I'll affirm good behavior. I will give this spoon to the child who is good. Now, she meant that to be positive. And so she would select the child that she thought at that moment was being good, and she would give the spoon to that child. Now, that may have worked out fine, except for the fact 
that this lady, the entire time she was growing up, never got the spoon. So now what's the message to her? You're not good. You are not good. You have never been good, and you will never be good enough to get the spoon. That was not Grandma's heart. That is not what she meant to convey. But that was the perception of the child. She grew up, she got married, she had children, and she found herself with a very unusual pattern of behavior. And she could not understand where it came from. But when things weren't going well, when things weren't all that good, she would go into the kitchen and pull out the ingredients and she would mix up a big batch of icing and other goodies and then she would lick the spoon. She would present herself with that spoon over and over and over again. She realized this was not a healthy pattern but she found herself doing it again and again, especially when she wasn't feeling too good about herself. She began meeting with a friend, and they were journaling together and talking about things from the past, and this story came up. And as it did, the friend was able to help her see how this had impacted her behavior. And so the way that they broke the line, you see, the enemy came in and he distorted for that little girl what was occurring in relationship with her grandma and with her own value. And he told her a lie, you are not good. And so as she saw that, she was able to break the lie. Now this is the good news. Here is the good news. This is the good news. We have the name that is able to break any lie the enemy would ever say to us. We have the blessed and the holy and the strong and the mighty name of Jesus. And we do not have to stay under the curse, under the lie of the enemy. Because our Lord and Savior has paid the price. He has shed his precious blood. He has made it possible for us to move from that place of deception into the truth that we might be set free. And so she began breaking the lie. Now, it only took one time to break the lie, but it took longer to break the pattern because we are habitual people. And so she had to work through her responses. She said for a while she would go in, pull out all the ingredients, and be stirring when it would come to her. Oh! Things aren't going too good for you, are they? And she would move away from it. She said then she found herself catching it as she entered the kitchen. And then before she got to the kitchen, she was able to identify what was going on. And instead of going to a bowl of icing, she went in to the Word of God. And she began to place that Word faithfully in her heart as a protection against the language of lies of the enemy. I find that there are three languages, there may be more, but these are three that I am aware of, the language of lies, the language of logic, and the language of law. The language of lies comes from the enemy of our soul to deceive us and to destroy us. The language of logic is a very valuable thing that God has given to us. He has made us to be reasonable people. And I am not speaking against logic. In fact, I believe that the Lord and all the angels in heaven would delight if we would be logical more frequently. I think that would please him. But we must understand that logic has limits. Logic has limits, and the limit is when it bumps against faith. Because there are some things that God will ask of you that will not be logical. Very often, our God is not logical. Have you noticed that? Hello, are you there? Have you noticed that God is not logical? Let me give you an example. If God had appointed you to go and find the place for his son to be born, 
Would it have ever entered your mind to check out a stinking stable? Would not have occurred to us. That would not have been logical. Logical to us would have been the finest hospital, and we would have had the most sanitary situation. We would have had the best doctors. We would have had at least a Jenny Lynn crib or something. You know, we would have had it beautiful and perfect for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But our God chose a stable. Would not have occurred to us. So logic has limits when it bumps up against faith. He will ask you to believe that which is not reasonable. And he will ask of you things that are not reasonable. He asks you to love your enemies. I have not yet figured out how to truly love those I care about. Hello. <laughs> you know, I'm still learning how to love those I truly care for deeply in a way that is healthy. And he asked me to love my enemies. So very often what he asks of us will not seem logical, and that is why we must not base our faith purely on our logic because we are limited. We are finite. He is infinite. Be logical, but no, there may be a point he asks you to give up your logic and to step into the arena of faith. Now, not only is it important that we learn to identify some of the lies that have become a regular part of our thinking process. And the way we do that is to ask our God, by the power of his spirit, to enlighten us, to begin to show us the discrepancies in what we are thinking and how we are processing information. And if that lines up clearly with the word of God, or if it does not, how we begin to resolve that. Because we want to have inner continuity. And that will help us then to live out the life of faith. And so we want to learn the importance of breaking lies. And we must also learn how to dispel myths. How to dispel myths. Now I call these balloon beliefs. These are things that we hang on to because they're pretty and they make us feel good. And we like them a lot but we find that they are just full of air. And we hang on so tightly as, as a child, and then we don't let go even when we become grown up, and that is why we see so many grown-ups acting childish. I know there are times in my life when I have a, a little temper tantrum inside. You know, I, well, why is she doing that to me? I don't like her anymore. And I think, how childish. See, he wants to heal that and deliver us of that. He wants us to be childlike, but not childish. And there was a gal who called me up, and she was saying to me, I have a lot of bizarre behavior patterns. And I said, well, tell me about them. She did, and I thought, well, that's true. Those are pretty bizarre. I could agree with that. She said, my husband is a counselor and he's kind of hidden me away at home because I'm not good advertising for <laughs> his ministry and he isn't sure what to do with me. And I said, well, why don't you share a little bit with me about your past? And she said, that isn't necessary. It isn't, it, my past was perfect. Everything was fine. We don't need to look at that. And there was this major emotional explosion of defensiveness. And when you hear someone saying, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, what do you know? It matters. It matters, and it matters a lot. So we talked a little bit more, and I could tell that that was very frightening for her to think about looking at a yesterday. And as we talked for a while, I moved back around, and I asked about how things were in her home when she was a child. She said they were just like the Nelson family. It was just like Ozzie and Harriet all of the time. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And what do I know now? Wasn't wonderful, was it? 
And I said, oh, Ozzy and Harriet, I used to love them. I watched them. I said, then, because they were Ozzy and Harriet, there must have been a lot of times that you heard your mom and dad share how much they love each other. She said, oh, no, my mother hated my father. <laughs> Pop, there went a balloon. I said, did you hear what you just said? I said, you told me it was Ozzy and Harriet, and then you say your mother hates your father. I said, I don't remember that in that sitcom. And she, I said, how did you know that your mother hated your father? Well, she told me. I said, oh, really, how old were you when she told you? She said, well, I was probably five. I said, honey, do you know that was emotionally abusive for you to have that information? She said, oh, no. She said, you don't understand. My mother, she needed a friend. I said, no, honey, you don't understand. At five years old, you didn't need her to be your friend. You needed her to be your protector from information like she hates your daddy. That was real hard for her to hear. The following day, she called back, and she was just amazed that that she had missed even that, and that was just the beginning of many other things. I encouraged her to seek godly counsel. I encouraged her to do some journaling, to be willing to let go of the little girl balloons, those myths, those balloon beliefs, because they weren't going to help her. They would only prevent her from growing up. I think one of the balloon beliefs that I come up against most frequently are mothers unable to hear the truth about their mothering. You know, at which then we teach our children they must never ever say we didn't do it right. And when they try to tell us something that may have caused them pain, we get defensive. Well, I don't know how you could say that about your father and I with all we did for you, the sacrifices we made, you ungrateful thing, you. And we say it in a lot of different ways. When it was time for our, my oldest son to go into the service and I realized I would have to release him, I sat him down and I said to him, Marty, all I ever wanted to be was the best mommy that any little boy ever had. But all I was capable of giving you was who I was at that time. And who I was was not always who you needed me to be. I have failed you. I'm sure at times I wounded your spirit. And I give you permission to seek counsel for your life. And I give you permission to speak specifically of my mothering in the right or the wrong aspects of it. Because my desire that goes much greater than protecting my reputation as a mother is that you might become a godly man. And I would encourage you moms not to feel overwhelmed when your children announce to you that you are imperfect. You need to be able to embrace the part that is accurate. Some of what the child grows up believing will have been the perception of a child that may not be accurate, but there will be aspects of it that will fit you like a glove. Take it from a mother who knows. Along with breaking lies and dispelling myths, we need to learn how to grieve. We need to learn how to release our grief, to release our grief. All of us carry around within us losses. And some of those losses we have never given ourselves permission to grieve for. We think it is unspiritual. We think that uh, this is, uh, others will think that, that I'm not trusting the Lord. And yet grieving is a very real part of the healing process of God. When I have moved from house to house, I have learned to give myself permission to grieve the loss of that home. I go in and I say goodbye to it. I go in, I go, goodbye, living room. My husband leaves about then and waits in the car. He does not want to hear me say goodbye to the rooms. But that is one of my ways of beginning to release it, acknowledge that this is a genuine loss, and then turn around and embrace 
the joy of the next place that he has given me. I find that I am more able to do that when I am honest about my loss. And so grieving as we release it helps us to have more inner space for the next step and stage of our life. When I think about grieving, it comes to mind in our home, along with having two sons, we have a belief system that if you have a boy, you must have a dog. Now, I do not know where that belief system came from. I only know that we have held to it very tightly. If you have a son, you must have a dog. So we have gone through a number of dogs in our life, and they have come with varied personalities. But one of the outstanding animals to come our way was a cockapoo, and her name, well, actually, I thought it was a he. I gave it away to someone who wanted a male dog. We had a cockapoo named Tuesday who gave birth to Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Well, I took the, the one puppy, and I thought, well, this is a boy, and that's what they want, so I gave it to them. They took it home and realized that they, they had named it Fred, and Fred began acting in ways that weren't cons consistent for uh, his gender and they realized that they would either have to have an operation on the animal or change the name. So they let me know that I was not too good in identifying things. <laughs> well, they had to move and they decided they did not want to take Fred with them and so they gave Fred back, who is now Freda. And as we received Freda, uh, not happily or joyfully, but out of an obligation of guilt that I had made this mistake, uh, this dog became Jason's, our youngest son. Now, this dog had an unusual behavior pattern, which may have come out of his identity crisis. I'm not sure. <laughs> but this dog was able to leap very high. It did not understand it was a cockapoo. It thought it was a kangaroo. And she could leap incredible heights. Now, part of this is she had a very gregarious personality. She liked being included, and I had excluded her. I had left her outdoors. So to be able to survive and feel a part of our family, she learned to leap straight up in the air, very high, and look into the window. <laughs> And then she would drop down, and our windows were not low, so this was a real accomplishment. She would then bounce over to the next window, leap up, and look in. Now, because she was a cockapoo, she was very fluffy. And when she would rise up, the wind would come under her ears, and they would stand straight out. Her eyes would look in very large, and then she would be gone. I mean, it was quite an amazing thing to see. Well, we had become quite accustomed to this animal's behavior, but it seemed to be a bit disconcerting for our guests. Now, part of the reason for that could have been that we never mentioned to them that we had this dog, or it could do these things, and we didn't tell them uh, until they had reached the point of personal crises. <laughs> and we could always tell when they had spotted her for the first time. Because they would be in conversation with you, and then <laughs> there would be like a jerk to their head, and you could see their eyes moving back and forth as they were trying to figure out what they had just seen and if it was safe to mention they had seen it. Now, we didn't say anything because we knew it would only be a few moments before she would repeat this act at another window. And we wanted to watch it build. So she would then reappear and now, you know, their eyebrows would knit together with concern for their future. And about the time they were ready to have themselves admitted, we would say to them, oh yes, it's our dog, Freda. 
Well, every morning that Jason went to school, Freda would go with Jason up to the bus stop. And Jason had to leave early. This was a requirement because when you have a dog that jumps straight up and down, it takes a lot longer to get where you are wanting to go. And so as they would make the trek up the hill, I would watch as Freda, whoo, boing. Boing. And they would gradually make it up, and then Jason would get on the bus, and Freda, after a time, would boing back down to our house. Now, this went on every day, and so one day I was taken by surprise when Jason ran back in the house breathless. Mom! Mom! Come quick! A car has hit Freda! And then he said, but I think it's going to be okay, because I saw her tail move. Well, I grabbed my house coat and went out the door. Now, I have to tell you this aside. This was a new house coat. I tell you that because I don't get many of those. I actually do not want many of those. I love my house coats, and I don't wash them. This is an important factor in having them mold to the body. And mold is probably the right word to use in this. All right, so I have on my new house coat. I go out the door. I start up the hill. Halfway up the hill, here comes a woman I have never seen in my life galloping down the hill right into my arms. And she is sobbing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I hit your dog. I hit your dog. I said, oh, honey, I know that you did not do this on purpose. I am so sorry for you. And she said, oh, she said, yesterday my cat died, and today I've hit your dog. I said, oh, sweetie, we do not hold you responsible for this. We are so sorry. Now, as she was sobbing, uh, her mascara was running in rivulets down my new house coat. <laughs> Being a spiritual person, I hardly noticed it. <laughs> I assured her once again that this was not to be a concern of hers, that, for, that she needed to go back to her car and go on to work, and that I would pray for her. So she started back up the hill and got into her vehicle. Well, as I got to the top of the hill, all of a sudden, here comes my husband in a pickup truck. Now, I do not know how word went from our home across the lake over to the conference center grounds, and he had already heard about it. I don't know how that happened, but here came the Lone Ranger, <laughs> and he had silver with him. Do you love how men have to have a pickup truck? I don't know what it is about a man and a pickup truck, but that's really important. They have to have a pickup truck. So he comes over the hill with his pickup truck. He stops, and he gets out, and he looks at me, and he shakes his head to let me know that there is no life left in this little dog. And he gently picks up our bouncy little friend, and he places him in the back of the truck. And I look around for Jason, and Jason has gone and got back into line for school. He's standing at the end of the line, and he has drawn himself in very tight. He has squished his eyes closed, and he is not looking. As I walk towards him, I can see the rigidness in his body. I know that he is trying to ward off seeing or hearing that which he does not want to know. And as I get close to him, I touch him. And I say, Jason, your little doggy has died. And Jason fell into the lower half of my house coat. <laughs> and he began sobbing. And I said, Jason, honey, you don't have to go to school today. And I took him by the hand, and we started down the hill that we could begin grieving. I mean, my husband, after he had put the dog in the truck, he looked over. I was crying. Jason was crying. The lady that hit the dog was crying. He looked at all that, and he said, I'm out of here. And uh, he left, and I could see him wiping his eyes as he took the little beloved pet away. And I realized that as Jason stood there, that he did something that you and I often do. We think, 
Well, maybe if I don't look, it'll go away. You know, maybe if I stand here and I pretend this didn't happen, then maybe I won't have to suffer the loss. But there are some hard things happening in your life. There are difficulty factors in my life. Resisting and refusing to look at that which is happening would not help us to resolve our conflict. Some of you have gone through tremendous loss in your life. It may be a broken marriage. It may be a damaged friendship. It may be a prodigal child. It may be financial disaster has occurred in your home. It may be that you have gone through the loss of physical well-being, but I know that there is loss in your life and that you need to grieve just as I do. You need to give yourself permission to grieve and you need to give permission to other people to grieve. It is a spiritual thing to do to grieve loss because you are facing that which is true. I was watching a movie on TV one evening and there was a girl who went through a very devastating event. And as she did, I began to weep. I've always thought that I was a sensitive person and cried easily because I was so sensitive. I did not realize that the first tear I shed was for you and the rest were for myself. And as I watched the show, I began to cry, thinking it was in response to her pain. But she went on in the movie to get better, and I kept crying. Then it went to commercial, and there's Oscar Mayer Wieners going on, and everybody's having a party, and I'm still crying. My husband had walked through the room several times, noticing my behavior, checking the set, looking at me. And by the time we got to commercials, he thought, well, this, like, doesn't fit real well. And I felt obligated to explain, and I said, well, it was just something that happened so sad to that girl of that movie, and it just, just made me cry. And he looked at me and he said, Honey, I don't think it's that girl you're crying about. There was something about him saying that to me that gave me permission to feel my own pain. And because he wasn't intimidated with my emotion, it gave me the freedom to express it. And I sobbed and I sobbed. And I sobbed. It was kind of scary because it felt like I wasn't in control. But when I trusted the Lord enough and myself enough to release this emotion and release that grief, I found in the days ahead that I could feel a new strength. And that there had been, from the pouring out of that pain and loss, a filling of his strength inside of me. It is important that we give ourselves permission to grieve. God has created us with the capacity for laughter. And have you ever noticed when you laugh really hard that you cry? And when you're all done, you say, that felt so good. <laughs> Laughter is not unspiritual. How could it be when our God created us with that capacity? You stop and you think about the laughter of a young child in another room. And you hear them laugh, that kind of giggle that goes way down into their tummies and their toes and comes back up and cascades through the house. And you begin to laugh and you don't even know what's funny. And you move in to join them in the joy of it. I remember that happening with Jason one day. And when I got to the door and I'm laughing away and I still don't even know what's funny. And I look out there and he's rolling on the ground with the puppies jumping all over his face licking him with love and what a beautiful picture that was and it brought my mother's heart delight to see it and it brings the father's heart delight 
when he sees and hears his children laughing for honorable reasons. And when you shed your tears, they are so precious to him that he collects them. There is a Lake Patsy in heaven. <laughs> I'm sure I will see it when I get there. But we need to learn, if we are to grow up, how to break lies so we can walk in the truth. That is so important for us to do and to release those little balloon beliefs, to dispel our myths, and to release our grief. And we need to learn how to give up games that are unhealthy, that we play in our homes. For those of you that are married, one of the unhealthy games is body bartering. Hello. Do I need to explain that at all? I'll be nice to you if you're nice to me. Unhealthy game, displeasing, dishonorable to the Lord. The game of manipulation, the way that works in the mindset is I'll do this and then she'll do that, then I'll say this, then she'll do this, then I'll get exactly what I wanted. We are not put here to control the lives of others. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. There are games we play that are childish and dishonorable. If you want to know your game, ask the Lord Jesus Christ. His Spirit will enlighten you. And then we need to learn how to establish boundaries. Boundaries were God's idea from the beginning. He said to Adam and Eve, take delight and enjoy all that you see, except do not cross this line. And if you do, it'll change the way we relate one with another. And they stepped over the line, and it changed the way that they related with their God. It changed the level of their intimacy. Boundaries are healthy. Ask God to help you how to establish those in your relationship with others. We are broken vessels some of us understand and embrace the thought that we are cracked pots. The good news is that God sees the brokenness and the deficiency and the distortions and the damage. He knows that we have a broken image and he longs to release us from our P-A-I-N pain and he longs to give us a P-A-N-E, a new pane of glass that we might see more clearly that which is accurate and true and therefore honorable. When you go home today, you will go remembering laughter and tears and fellowship and sweetness, but you may enter into a home filled with dissension. So go prepared. Pull up your courage and your strength. Don't go in and overwhelm your family with your joy until they're nauseous. <laughs> go in gently and lovingly and prepared to give. You see, while you've been here having a good time, your family thinks you rested. <laughs> and they're making a list of what they expect of you as we speak. And so when you walk in the door dragging your little wagon, they may put many demands on you that could rob you of the joy of this time. You need to go in there with the servant's heart, ready to give, asking God for strength beyond your ability that you might begin to effectively minister, not with just your words, but with your deeds, your behavior, and especially girls with your attitudes, to go in with sweetness and joy, that that might be seen through the broken places of your life, and that the family might rejoice together in the faithfulness of God. Let's pray. Father, it has been good to be here in your presence, and we thank you that we have the privilege of that because we come in that strong and mighty name of Jesus. 
Sweet Jesus, Lord and Savior, how grateful we are for your finished work at Calvary. How we rejoice that it did not end at the grave, but that you rose up and that you ascended and you sit at the right hand of Father God making intercession for us, for we need someone to intercede and we know you are the only one able to do that. And so we are grateful and we thank you. And oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher and you would move us into all truth. That you would show us the areas that we have been reluctant or resistant or just blinded in and have not seen before that you would show us those areas and that we would be faithful to draw from the counsel of God. Father, we don't want the enemy implanting a lie so deeply that it corrupts our character, but we want you to show us the lie that we might break it in your holy name. And we ask that you would give us the courage to release our little balloon beliefs and that we would give each other permission to grieve, that we would hold each other and let the other cry because those tears are precious to you and important for us to release. Otherwise, you would not have given us a way to do that. We thank you for the joy of laughter and the release of tears. We ask that we would not remain childish and play games that are unhealthy and that we would learn how to establish boundaries in relationships, not barriers, but boundaries that would allow us to be faithful first to you and then to those that you have placed around us. We thank you for your redeeming love and for the incredible comfort of knowing that you do use cracked pots. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.